Good afternoon and welcome to day three and our final session of today's uh, concurrent sessions. My name is Alex Chapello and I'm providing some housekeeping information for today's session. Today's session is on Adobe Connect, therefore to reduce any technical issues with the audio, please mute your microphone and turn your speakers on. You can find those controls along the top of your screen. If you'd like to dial in via telephone, please use the telephone number located in the technical assistance pod on your left. If you're able, please join Adobe Connect uh, through the application rather than the internet browser. This allows for a better user experience. If you experience any technical issues, please email us at FEMA-2021HMWorkshop at FEMA.DHS.gov. This email is located in the technical assistance pod on your left. Note that you can submit questions through the, uh, throughout the presentation in the Q&A pod on the right of your screen. At the end of the session, we'll have, we'll have a series of polling questions for you, and we will bring that up on the screen. Following those questions, we will go to our wrap-up session at the end of the day at 4 p.m. Lastly, on Adobe Connect, we have files for download should you want to download them. Those are on the lower left-hand side of your screen, and thank you. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Kelly St. John. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? You sound great. You just need to turn your camera on when you get a chance. Uh, great. Here we are. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me today. Um, well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm glad to see that we still have so many in the final session on the final day of the workshop engaged. Um, as Alex said, I'm Kelly St. John. I'm a Resiliency Grants Manager with the City of Buffalo. I work within the Buffalo Fire Department and the Office of the Mayor, and I'm pleased to be able to share with you all today how the City of Buffalo is thinking about future conditions as we respond and adapt to the impacts of climate change locally. So for today, I have five major points I'm going to touch on that will articulate how the city is emphasizing coordination and integration of climate hazards response through planning and policy activities across many of our departments and across various levels of government um, with an explicit focus on equity and resilience in our actions. So we have um, a bit of context. We have a really unique geography here in mm -hmm. Buffalo. We're situated at the convergence of two great lakes, which creates a unique microclimate. Our region experiences nationally ranked annual snowfall totals during the winter months, but also we have a built-in cooling source during the summer months. Um, the, the city is about not quite 53 square miles. We're the second largest city in New York outside of um, New York City and Manhattan. And our population is interesting. Our city has experienced steady population decline from the early 1900s until the mid-2000s when we saw that expats, refugees, and immigrants began re returning and settling due to reasons such as the low cost of living and our accessibility to major metro areas. So we have had a pretty stable population, right around a quarter million people. Um, and I don't know if any of you have been tuned into the census um, data that's starting to come out in estimate form like we have here, but um, our hopes of population increase don't look like they're going to come to fruition anytime soon. But we do have about a quarter million people. And one of the unique things about our infrastructure and the systems we have in place is that we're actually set up and built for a much larger population. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, how that relates to resilience. Um, another note on our geography is that we are an international border, border city in the Great Lakes. We share infrastructure and an economy in some regard with Ontario, Canada. So climate change, when we talk about that in the context of Buffalo, we utilize local, regional, and national level data and assessments some of which we've heard the presenters earlier in the day discuss. So our local conditions um, have really been evaluated and brought to the forefront by our high ed higher education industry in Buffalo and Western New York. They're an invaluable resource, especially given the wealth of relevant climate research that's occurring at institutions such as the University of Buffalo and Buffalo State College. Um, a study was completed not um, just a few years ago of local conditions in the 2000s compared to pre-1990s data beginning back as early as 1940s and 50s, documenting warming in our region um, at a rate slightly lower than the national average. And I want to note 
that there was a, a documented change that is of concern to us is the decrease in lake ice coverage, but also the increase in severe weather events. That was found through that local um, analysis. When we look at regional models, we see um, similar trends in uh, near, mid, and long-term projections under business as usual scenarios that align with the documented local trends where precipitation is increasing and temperature is creeping upward. Um, and here you'll see we've used uh, models from GLISA, um, the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessment Center, which is a NOAA Regional Sciences, Science Center for the Great Lakes. And again, um, using those same GLISA projections, we look at projections of seasonal variation in temperature and precipitation, which have interest because we experience four distinct seasons in Western New York. Um, it's a blessing, but it's also sometimes the butt of a joke when you hear us talking about experiencing all four seasons in a week. Um, but we can use this information to hypothesize how climate impact will manifest based on comparing the projections um, that we're seeing from regional and national models, but then also the, the local trends. And so an example of that is looking at the increase in overall temperature potentially contributing to warmer winter months that bring a greater volume of precipitation events and whether those precipitation events are going to be snow or rain or a combination of the two. And then similarly at the national model, we rely really heavily on the national climate assessment, which I know um, some of our representatives talked about earlier in the day. And we look at the Northeast region specifically and majority of the emphasis there is again on temperature and precipitation increasing, but then the increased risk to population and human health because of some of the existing built environment um, features and systems that we have in place in an old city such as Buffalo. And so when we talk, when we think about the climate projections, we have to anticipate the impact and when we're when we're anticipating the impact, we're thinking specifically about how the models vary on the increase in frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, but then also how that, that impacts things such as um, our heating and cooling days, the length of our freeze-free period, and the impacts that could have for our local um, agricultural sector and that part of the economy. And then again, the lake ice coverage and how um, that is decreasing overall, but also that there's the ice, the ice out date is trending earlier in the spring, meaning when the lake becomes ice free, it's happening earlier every year. So then when it comes to um, combining all of this information and really understanding the impact and how this affects how we operate locally, we start looking at case studies. So the NCA gives us a great case study of heat hazards related to heat-related ER visits. Um, I believe the study was completed for Rhode Island, and it looked at three plus weeks of uncomfortably hot weather between 2015 and 2016. Um, that's, that's the increase amount since the 1950s. And then the, during that time, the risk of heat-related ER visits increased dramatically. You can see almost that hockey puck-shaped graph there in the middle um, as maximum daily temperatures climbed above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And the result of that ended up being that there were projected increases in annual heat-related ER visits, potentially by up to as many as 400 annually by 2050. And those numbers continue to increase you know, each year thereafter that you perform the assessment. And that's under, something of note is that's under a low emission scenario project, or projection, excuse me. Um, so that you'll see that on the graph all the way on the right there. So when we think about, um, when we think about the anticipated impact, but then how those impacts are going to affect us, a question that has been brought to the forefront a lot is this idea of should we should you move to Buffalo? And we see um, we see this question coming up in articles such as in the New York Times, Harvard research studies coming out asking similar questions about where are the best places to 
migrate to and settle, um, settle in in the wake of climate change. And we're starting to see some anecdotal evidence supporting this idea of Buffalo being a climate refuge or a place where the impacts of climate change are relatively low comparatively to other major metropolitan areas. And we have to start thinking about what sorts of impacts that might have for our local community that's currently here and the community that might be coming and joining us. So there's been national media attention. Um, the freshwater access is unparalleled. We have about six, almost 15% of the total Great Lakes freshwater between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And I, you know, I mentioned some of the anecdotal evidence. Um, Buffalo had upwards of 10,000 people come and settle here both temporarily and permanently in the wake of Hurricane Maria in um, 2017. So there's a lot of new economic opportunity, but also some major considerations around marginalization, equity and provision of services, and um, planning moving forward. So the whole idea of Buffalo as a climate refuge today was a was a initiative of Mayor Byron W. Brown, um, really getting a kickoff in 2018 with the start of some um, really impactful climate action. So the planning work started back in 2015 when Mayor Brown signed on to the U.S. Covenant of Mayors um, or the U.S. Conference of Mayors, excuse me, Climate Protection Agreement which agreed to Kyoto level um, protocols for greenhouse gas emissions. And that same year, the city of Buffalo completed an energy master plan um, as a partnership with the New York Power Authority and the five other major cities across New York State, looking at ways that we could reduce our energy usage and be more efficient about our consumption. In 2017, the Buffalo Green Code was passed, which was um, an historic upgrade of the 50-year-old zoning and land use um, zoning code and land use ordinance, which prioritized environmental features above as a highest and best use of the land in the city of Buffalo. And then in 2018, when Mayor Brown um, made the announcement of planning for Buffalo as a climate refuge city, it was the same year that we completed our rain check initiative, or at least the first phase of our rain check initiative. So in 2018, um, rain check was used as an opportunity to address the EPA required long-term control plan um, protocols for reducing combined sewer overflow events, which is an element of our infrastructure that other folks on the call that are in the Northeast or in older cities um, also probably have to deal with and will understand the woes of. But in 2018, the mayor also started. Um, the mayor also started addressing information gaps. What's missing? What haven't we done? And where do we go from here? And so, grants management was a key focus from 2018 forward of how the city of Buffalo can address um, address critical information and, and capacity gaps within existing city departments, but also be more competitive about aggressively addressing the impact we know we're going to see from climate change and where we have, where we're under-resourced or we have underutilization of our existing resources um, as a way to address climate change. So in 2018, grants management specialists were hired specifically around sustainability, climate action, and resilience, which is the position that I'm filling um, and I'm talking to you from today. And uh, a really key point of this grants management team was to assess opportunities and then secure financing and oversee implementation and evaluation of efforts that address needs within ex existing operational needs within the departments and within the community of Buffalo with a, with a mind towards coordinating efforts across departments and using implementing sustainability, climate, and resilience principles. So this is a resource that facilitates department-level projects and supports citywide initiatives. A few of our partners and some of our initiatives are featured there on the right side of the slide. Um, and the current portfolio that this grants management team now maintains is a is um, 
leveraging a prop just under $20 million of current city resources to support over $40 million in projects. And then we have um, upwards of $100 million coming pledged through other programs, such as the $68 million coming from the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation to do waterfront park redevelopment in the city of Buffalo. So an element of this grants management project was an update to, or the grants management team was a project that focused specifically on updating the city of Buffalo's comprehensive emergency management plan. And this was done with an explicit focus on climate change, understanding that as the frequency and intensity of hazards fluctuate locally, Buffalo Fire, along with their partners in local government and first response services, has been called to more robust and demanding service um, to support community response reduction and recovery. So, Buffalo Fire is an approximately 700 member career force um, that covers the entire area of the city of Buffalo. And we also provide automatic and mutual aid to the surrounding communities, first and second ring suburbs, um, given that we are the largest um, first response agency in the region within um, Erie and Niagara counties. So the Buffalo Fire Department led the update, update of the Kemp with um, in, um, with the interaction and engagement of our IT department and our police department, the county emergency management services, and others. Um, and the purpose of the Kemp was really to be an all hazards mitigation plan. So it's not only looking at what hazards are we going to potentially have to face and how can we mitigate those hazards, but then how are we responding to and reacting to those hazards um, um, as they come and as they happen. It was about an 18 month process and it utilized local and state funds um, from the Department of Homeland Security and Environmental Services in New York State, which are passed through funds from the FEMA um, Department of Homeland Security. And it was a pretty straightforward planning process. We hired a contractor to prepare the plan and provide um, a schedule for implementation and training. The unique aspect of it was that the specific climate related hazards incorporated into the plan included extreme temperature events, focusing mostly on extreme heat events, given that Buffalo is known for its winters. And so responding to winter, um, winter events is something that our existing first responder agencies and our community have a certain degree of capacity for, but that heat is a persistent problem. And then it also addresses flood, ice storms, and severe winter storms with a focus on wind events. So one such instance where um, the comprehensive emergency management plan wasn't updated, but would have been very useful, um, so you could say was a precursor to um, why we needed part of this um, climate focus update on our, our hazard mitigation plan was an event known well um, in Western New York, it's November, which was a four day severely effect snow event that happened in November of 2014, right around Thanksgiving that across 23 locations in the eight, diff the eight county region of Western New York, snowfall totaled over those four days ranged from 13 inches to 88 inches. So a nine feet of snow fell. And um, it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't any real abnormal weather pattern that we haven't seen. What happened was there was a convergence between the increased very unseasonably warm temperature of Lake Erie and the low press pressure system with the bitter cold. So it was this very unique convergence of temperatures and the system that caused all the snow to fall. We had interstate highways and local roads that were completely impassable. There were numerous roofs that caved in and we had every single first response and emergency service agency in the eight county region providing support to a very small geographic area in Buffalo and the suburbs immediately south to address the emergency. So just a few photos. This is um, looking from City Hall southward, southwestward uh, across Lake Erie, and this is the wall of snow 
that you could see that just sat over the southern parts of the city. And this is um, the shot on the left is of the Interstate 90, which is the major uh, the major highway that goes through our region. There were cars stuck on the highway for upwards of 24 and 27 hours. And you could see the gentleman on the right shoveling his way out of his home with a wall of snow about five feet high. Similar event that happened um, not much more uh, than a few months later was February of 2015 when we had a cold wave due to the polar vortex in the United States. And in the month of February, it was the coldest month on recorded history. The average temperature was barely 11 degrees Fahrenheit. And the entire month remained, so the entire month remained below freezing with 10 sub-zero days. Um, it, the, during that month, Lake Erie was nearly 100% covered with ice, which hasn't happened in some time. And frozen infrastructure made dangerous traveling conditions. And we, almost the entire month of February, was a cold blue month in the city of Buffalo. So that prompted the city of Buffalo to open warming centers um, and utilize some of our existing community assets and community service organizations to provide overnight um, safe spaces for folks to for folks to live um, temporarily during the during the cold snap event. And then a few years later, in February of 2019, um, we had a two-day severe wind event that caused that was wind um, and ice related. And what happened was there were gusts of between 68 to 80 miles an hour sweeping across Erie and Niagara counties some of which reached cyclone level classification for um, the severity of the wind. And it caused an eight and a half foot long prolonged stage on Lake Erie, which not only resulted in wide flood, widespread flooding, but the, the volume and the intensity of the wind actually pushed the entire, broke the ice um, that was on the lake and pushed the ice up along coastlines and backed it up into our neighboring waterways, our rivers. Um, it broke our ice boom, which usually keeps our navigable waterways free of ice during the winter so that we can maintain shipping and um, access as needed along the coast. And it caused days long power outages, um, thousands of downed trees across the region, and again, roadways blockage. Some of the walls of ice that folks were seeing um, in our communities to the south, this photo was taken in Hamburg, just about 10 minutes south of the city of Buffalo. So we think about all these events and the understanding that we have about climate change and the hazards that um, climate change is going to impose on our community. And that identifies a need for operational resiliency. So really thinking about who's at the table, who's involved in the conversation, and how can we ensure that each of these departments that provide first responder services, um, first response and emergency services, but also community, um, community engagement and outreach and um, uh, connection points are all working together around a, a united narrative um, to be able to reach the folks that need the information that are going to be most impacted and do so effectively and efficiently. So what we're moving into now is resiliency planning and really taking an eye for resiliency planning um, as we move forward with our, our coordinated planning services around climate. So as I mentioned earlier, the Energy Master Plan was started um, or was passed in 2015 with a goal to decrease municipal energy consumption 20% by 2020. But we recognize the opportunity for um, an energy focused plan to help mitigate some of the effects of climate change by decreasing our carbon emissions. And so the energy master plan has an explicit focus on increasing the resiliency of our existing energy system. Um, system and promoting opportunities for distributed energy generation infrastructure, recognizing that when we had events such as the November event in 2014, there were hundreds, thousands of homes without power for a consistent time. And that is 
that is um, a huge vulnerability within um, populations that are homebound or populations that um, uh, don't have access to uh, available resources. So looking at opportunities for resilience in our own infrastructure systems, which increases our community resilience. Um, it also looks at ways to reduce our emissions and our fossil fuel dependence and our fleet. And then supports our partners in government and the private sector to reach similar goals. I also mentioned the Green Code um, that was passed in 2017. We went back and looked at the Green Code for ways that we could enhance community resilience and, and look at climate hazard planning. So some of the elements of the Green Code that support this um, are incorporated such as incorporating smart growth principles and complete street guidelines, which really focus on the built environment aspects that can help us mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change. Um, paying attention to our waterfront and using it as a buffer of protection and habitat conservation, putting habitat conservation requirements into the code so that we restore and strengthen the environmental assets that we have in our community. Um, this is a nature-based solutions opportunity that was discussed earlier in the day. And then um, preserving critical, preserving and protecting critical natural and open spaces in the city. Not only providing potential oases for um, cooling uh, for communities on high heat days, especially in, for communities with an older housing stock that don't necessarily have access to air conditioners, but also um, uh, providing a nature-based solution for um, increased precipitation events. And then I talked, uh, I talked, touched on a little bit about rain check. Rain check has evolved, and there was um, a multi-year study of rain check after initially assessing the opportunities for implementing green infrastructure to decrease CSO events, we took rain check one step further and looked at ways that we could use green infrastructure to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change, but also increase the resiliency of our communities by doing an equity analysis that took into account built environment, natural environment, infrastructure and socioeconomic factors of communities in each of the high needs CSO basins across the city that were having the highest number and most intense um, overflow events and use that as a way to assess where we need to prioritize implementing green infrastructure. And some of the ways that we're thinking about green infrastructure for adaptation is an opportunity for green job development, but also restoring and replacing green space in communities that have historically had disinvestment around green space and open space and parkland. And then the, you know, the long list of mitigation um, impacts that, that uh, green infrastructure can have, such as capturing rainwater and reducing um, runoff and things like that. So what Rain Check really does is promote community resilience through the co-benefits of green infrastructure, which a few of the presenters earlier in the day talked about. And it's this overlapping um, framework of economy, community, and environment that when they come together, um, really hits on the equity point by directing public investment into neighborhoods that have had historic disinvestment, but that also stand to benefit the most and in the shortest time from implementing green infrastructure. And the, the final initiative that we've undertaken that supports our, our hazard mitigation planning is participation in climate smart communities. So this is a New York State program that supports local governments to build sustainable and balanced climate action programs by requiring a municipal commitment of an elected, elected official on a 10-point pledge, which the city passed as a resolution in um, 20, 2019. And in doing this and taking various actions, the city of Buffalo has become a certified bronze community, which means that we've hit that sort of first tier of recognition within the program at the state level um, in the climate mitigation and adaptation actions that we have taken. 
And so we have an opportunity through this program, which we're using as a framework for our, our climate planning efforts, to be a leader as we pursue higher levels of, of certification. And one way we're doing that is by undertaking a comprehensive resiliency planning initiative. So in 2020, um, right around the time that the pandemic um, really hit us here in Buffalo and we started feeling the effects on it, of it on our economy and also our jobs and the way we operate, the city of Buffalo received an $80,000 planning grant from the Department of Environmental Conservation at New York State to implement five different actions um, of the Climate Smart Communities Program coordinated in such a way that we're building a framework for a, a phase one climate resiliency plan for the city of Buffalo. And this plan, this phase one, really looked at local government operations and bringing resilience around our local government operations, but does so in a way that incorporates the community and highlights opportunities for the local government to act more coordinated and more efficiently but do so in a way that increases the level of service provision for the community and, and, and holds up um, community assets rather than the need to come in and create something totally new from scratch, which takes more time and requires more resources. So we're really building on our existing framework and the assets and the knowledge base that already exists in the community to make ourselves more resilient in the long run. So the, there's a Department of Environmental Conservation tool that we're using, it's called Climate Smart Resiliency Planning. And this was developed um, in the early 2010s, around 2014, um, by some communities that participated downstate Hudson Valley um, and near Long Island in Manhattan that looked mostly at flooding, but the tool was expanded in the years thereafter to look at multiple hazards. And what this Climate Smart Resiliency Planning tool allows us to do is review comprehensively and with um, a consistent matrix of evaluation our existing plans, policies, and codes, and engage decision makers around where we have gaps and opportunities as those plans and policies relate to the known impacts of or the anticipated impacts of climate change that are documented through um, GLISA and the, and the NCA and our regional trend analysis. And in this process, we'll have opportunities to um, assess risk and vulnerability in our communities and do public outreach and um, engagement. So the result of this will be a coordinated climate action plan and resilience strategy for local government that directly integrates the community's voice and the community's, um, uh, the community's knowledge of climate with the intent that phase two, which will get started in the next couple of years here with some funding from the Department of Environmental Conservation and also funding um, from state and local partners will be a community-oriented strategy that incorporates the hazards that we've looked at at a local government operational level and truly understanding how those hazards impact the community and what assets exist in the community and what needs the community has in order to um, in order to address those hazards and be more ready to respond to and then flourish in the future in the, the sort of unknown conditions um, that will be coming due to climate change. And I think with that, I'm at time. So I will pause for a minute um, and let everybody get caught up. And I think Alex has some questions that are coming through. Yes, can I post the presenter chat for you? Okay, I see. So the first question says, it's great to see all the work that Buffalo is doing to support better integration. Thank you. Um, do you have any recommendations for smaller communities that may not have the resources to hire dedicated grant staff? Okay. Yep. So might there be examples? Might there be opportunities to leverage county staff or any that I know of? 
Um, this is a great question, and it's something that I actually I get to talk on. Um, I get to touch on a lot, and I enjoy touching on because because this is um, it's actually an issue that the city of Buffalo faced. So I mentioned that the city of Buffalo is the second largest city in New York State, but because of our um, historic disinvestment and because of the population decline, the city of Buffalo went through a 20-year period of really um, just destructive and um, reductive um, financial constraints. And so the city of Buffalo, um, it was only in the last like 10 to 15 years that we've been building back the staff capacity within uh, local government departments. So I think my, my uh, recommendation to smaller communities would be absolutely to rely on the existing staff that you have and the knowledge that you have on staff. It was certainly um, a huge benefit to the city that we had some resources available to be able to hire grant staff. But if you're a small community, you know, relying on your county is a great way to, um, to access resources and to build capacity. Um, we also, one of the elements of the Climate Smart Communities Program is we have a task force of local residents, um, a few representatives from city government staff, um, and also um, higher education institutions and businesses that come together bi-monthly. And that task force has really been instrumental in shaping the trajectory of our programming. And one resource they've provided is doing evaluation of our grant activities. And so, you know, you a smaller community, you might have a board or a commission of local volunteers that um, is really interested in how climate change might be affecting, you know, your coastline or your, you know, your heating events, um, how, how your residents heat your home. And so that, that's a resource I would absolutely suggest tapping into as well. Don't see any other questions coming through so far. Are there any other questions at this time? Oh, I see some here. I don't see any other questions. Um, I think something that I will emphasize Again, just as I have a little bit more time here at the end of the session, um, it's the success of the work that we're doing in Buffalo um, has, has really happened over a number of years by a number of different agencies. And it's really, it's really been a matter of um, the patchwork quilt, quilt, as I heard somebody mention in an earlier session, the idea being that we're addressing, we're addressing known issues that, that touch on the activities of many different departments, but also um, have reach within many different areas of our community and you know, the social life and the economy of the city of Buffalo. But we're doing that where we know there's funding and where we know there's a need to address an existing problem. So I just see a question that's come in about rain checks. That's a great example. Rain check was partially funded through the EPA through the mandate um, that came to um, our Buffalo Sewer Authority, which is the agency that runs our sewer and wastewater infrastructure in Buffalo. So it was partially funded through EPA. That was partially funded through the Buffalo Sewer Authority operating budget. And the need to address um, and update our long-term control plan and the combined sewer overflow events that were, off, that were happening in our city was an opportunity to evaluate how that might change under different climate models and the projections for the future and do so in a way that built up the, the resources um, and the, the opportunities and the economy within our city without putting in more hard or gray infrastructure that would potentially fail 
or be less resilient to changes as they happen in the future. So it's, a, it's looking at where there are existing needs or existing gaps and faults in the framework that we currently have and looking forward to the future and saying, how can we address this now with the funding we know is coming available or the maybe even a little bit of funding we have available um, and do so in a way that's going to put us in a better place in the future. Um, uh, another recommendation I have is that our one of our partners in government at Erie County, who we do a lot of planning work with, but also do a lot of emergency services work with, um, they, after about, a, I think, almost a four-year period, were able to successfully advocate um, to the county legislature to introduce a special fund in their budget called the Paris Fund. And this, the name is a nod to the Paris Climate Agreement, which our county executive um, in 2016 committed to staying in on um, and helping to reach the goals of, um, even though our federal government at the time had decided to withdraw from the agreement. And what the fund does is it takes the savings generated by energy efficiency projects and upgrades done across um, different operational areas of county government. And it captures the, a small portion of those savings into a fund that then helps to set up and fund additional projects moving forward. So that's something we're looking at doing at the city as well. Um, we are assessing opportunities for capturing savings from small projects we might be doing either with lighting or um, recognition grants that we're getting. And then using that money to pursue and, and make progress on other projects that we have in the queue to continue to implement climate adaptation and mitigation actions that have a positive impact for how the city of Buffalo operates as, as an institutional agency, but also how the community is set up to, um, to handle and respond to and then come out of and move forward on the impacts of climate change. Um, and it looks like maybe Susan has one last question about green infrastructure favorite projects. Um, I don't know if she's talking in the city of Buffalo or uh, another area, but um, Something we've done in the city of Buffalo, um, and you can see this by going to raincheckbuffalo.org online or going to Buffalo Sewer Authority slash raincheck, um, is there was um, a complete redevelopment of the Ohio Street corridor, which is in South Buffalo. And that, that um, redevelopment not only focused on redoing the streetscape so that it was more pedestrian and non-vehicle mode of transportation friendly, so by implementing bike lanes and um, increasing the size of the sidewalks, but also implemented green infrastructure. Um, so I think it's a really great example of how green infrastructure can be a catalyst for other infrastructure improvements and make cities and communities um, uh, more more resilient to climate change, but also make them more more people friendly. Um, so it looks like we'll be wrapping up here um, in just a minute. Um, there is a question that came in about FEMA and BRIC. We did not apply for BRIC this year. Unfortunately, the timing didn't work out with the projects that we have and with um, our state and local partners. But BRIC is something that we will be engaging in in the future. We have some projects queued up that we'll be looking at for the coming years. I think something that was important for us recognizing with BRIC was that there's a state application process first before the federal, that's a precursor to the uh, federal application process. So the, the dates and timelines and the structures of understanding the application process are really critical to being successful. And with that, I will wrap up. Thank you so much to everybody that was here today and participated. I was really happy. Um, it was a great opportunity to be able to share the work we're doing in Buffalo. And I hope that you'll all um, keep a follow as we continue the work. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Alex.
Kelly, thank you so much. That was awesome. And I want to um, thank everyone today on the phone um, or on the computer for your time today. I'm going to switch to a polling pod. Um, I'd like you to um, provide some feedback on today's session. And then after a couple of minutes or so, once I see the polling has died down a little bit, I'll switch over to our last slide, which will get you right into our reflection session. And today's reflection session is going to be awesome because um, it's going to do a, a full reflection from the last few days of our workshop. So we look forward to seeing you there.